Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I shall be your host today. As the year's end holiday season continues to unfold, I have been musing on the two words, coming home. F. Scott Fitzgerald once contemplated, quote, it's a funny thing coming home. Nothing changes. Everything looks the same, feels the same, even smells the same. You realized what's changed is you. Hmm. Charlotte Bronte nudged Jane Eyre to a spouse. Thank you, Mr. Rochester, for your great kindness. I am strangely glad to get back again to you, and wherever you are is my home, my only home. Even Paul Simon weighed in with a deep yearning in the song Homeward Bound, with the simple line, I wish I was homeward bound. Failing to select the more correct word were before the words homeward bound. But for today's program, it strikes me how ironic are the words of Robert Frost. Home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Remember the word take and the more operative variation taken in as we explore today's book taken in what exactly is it about the experience of coming home a saturday night live sketch might well have this week's hosts austin butler star of the Oscar-bound film Elvis, and Lizzo, hotter than hot with her new single, Rumors, the two of them dressed as homing pigeons, refusing to go home for the holidays. Lizzo as a homing pigeon. She'd do it and it would be hilarious. I remember as a child, the frequent, quote, I told you so, utterances of my parents gossiping with other locals in our small village when referring to townsfolk who went away and eventually came back home. I vowed, I vowed I would never be one of them. I wanted more than anything as a teenager to see the world and never returned to East Podunk, Maine. Well, five continents, 17 countries and 23 cities of life work experiences later, I'm back for at least part of the year and a short 66.1 miles from the room where set my bassinet on day one. <laughs> Coming home. William C. Faulkner said, how often have I lain beneath rain on a strange roof thinking of home? And finally, Fyodor Dostoevsky, everyone needs a somewhere, a place he can go. There comes a time, you see, inevitably, there comes a time you have to have a somewhere you can go. Not so true for many, but as true as spring follows winter for many more. Today's book in the spotlight is indeed about a return to the area, a coming home, as it were. Quote, a suspenseful, funny, and chilling uncovering of small town secrets within a propulsive family drama. 
a perfect read about a perfect vacation haven. Those words spoken by Angie Kim, author of the book Miracle Creek. American novelist and short story writer Richard Ford, best known for his novel The Sports Writer, interjects a strong sense of intrigue in his praise, quote, in deft knowing and crystalline prose, this exciting new main author writes, in essence, the novel about the Maine coast. A winsome, perplexing, and ultimately shadowy place that doesn't give up its best and big secrets easily. The book for today is entitled The Mid Coast, published earlier this year by Hogarth Random House. And the young author is Adam White, a boy of the mid coast who left to explore the world, but comes home to Damaris Scotta through the experiences of his protagonist and wife, Andrew and Maeve. But before exploring the story tone, let's consider some facts about the author. Quoting a bold and insightful new voice in fiction. Bang, pow, boom. <laughs> this quote from noted author of Something New Under the Sun, Alexandra Kleeman, says it all in eight big words. A bold and insightful new voice in fiction. But who is this insightful new voice impacting the main and indeed the national fiction writing scene? <laughs> in true understated main style, there are only a handful of words to be found about this seemingly unassuming bright young man who grew up on the main seacoast haven of Damrascotta, and now keeps a sharp eye on his hometown from away in Massachusetts. We know he earned an MFA degree from Columbia University. We know he is tall with Ivy League good looks. We know he is married with a young son. We know he lives with his family in Boston. We know he teaches writing and coaches lacrosse. P.S. Both key elements in the book. We know The Mid Coast is his first book. We know the book's bibliographic information assigns to the subjects line the categories literary, small town rural, and crime. We know it has 352 pages. That's it. That's the end of the bio. <laughs> Let's say that for now, Adam White keeps his hand close to his chest but lots of other people are not so reticent. No better place to start listing the biggest and brightest accolades with these words from the New York Times Editor's Choice for National Bestseller announcement. Propulsive, an absorbing look at small town Maine and the thwarted dreams of a family trying to transcend it. Hmm, intriguing for sure. Nothing hold back about that statement. From the book, wherever he went, the ocean went with him. The salt in his beard, the mud beneath his nails. Welcome back, Adam White to our mid-coast main niche. 
thanks for coming home. A Midcoast, a novel, the Midcoast, a novel. Quoting for starters, I don't know how many of my neighbors would have done what I did, but I'm sure they all would have felt the urge. That line from the book. And is surely a curiosity sparker. <laughs> Publisher Hogarth Books sums up the story of the Midcoast in these 29 words. Quote, the story of a family of lobstermen who skyrocket from poverty to wealth. A local writer obsessed with their rise and the small town secrets that mind them and mend them all together. Allow me to embellish just a bit beyond 29 words. It's spring in the tiny town of tiny town of Damascotta, a tourist haven on the coast of Maine, known for its oysters and antiques. Andrew, a high school English teacher recently returned to the area, has brought his family to Ed and Steph Thatch's sprawling Riverside estate to attend a reception for the Amherst women's lacrosse team. Back when they were all teenagers, Andrew never could have predicted that Ed descended from a long line of lobstermen or Steph, a decent student until she dropped out to start a family, would one day send a daughter to a place like Amherst. But so the tides have turned and Andrew's trying hard to admire more than envy the view from Ed's rolling backyard meadow. As Andrew wanders through the Thatcher's home, he stumbles upon a file he's not supposed to see. Photos of a torched body in a burned out sedan. And when a line of state police cruisers crashes the Thatcher's reception an hour later, Andrew and his neighbors finally begin to see the truth behind Ed and Steph's remarkable rise. Soon the newspapers are running headlines about the Thatches and Andrew's pouring over his memories, trying to piece together the story of a family he thought he knew. A propulsive drama that cares as deeply about its characters as it does about the crimes they commit. The Midcoast explores the machinations of privilege, the dark recesses of the American dream, and the lies we tell as we try at all costs to protect the ones we love. In my humble opinion, Although a term assigned to another sport other than lacrosse, I think the book is a slam dunk of a good read. Without hesitation, I found myself sidling up beside a great storyteller of our day, Mr. David Benioff, co-creator of Games of Thrones, who after reading the book, yelled to the world, I tore through the saga of the Thatch family in two nights. The Midcoast is a reader's dream, tense, ominous, and deeply wise. Woo. I'm another avid reader and lover of storytelling who has become a new BFF, best friend forever of Adam White and his stellar first novel, The Midcoast. Congratulations, Adam. <laughs> As I read today, I'm going to begin at the beginning and Adam writes a fairly lengthy prologue, uh, which is unlike some prologues, certainly shares a whole lot of information. We're going to go through the prologue and then hope to get through chapter one, 
uh, which brings us back in time a bit. So let me begin with the prologue of The Mid Coast by Adam White. Back when I lived out of state, people always used to get excited when they found out where I was from. That they didn't meet all that many Mainers. I was like a moose descended from a log cabin, wandering their backyard, eating their shrimp. And wondered if I was from anywhere near the town where they'd gone to summer camp or cruised in their custom sloop. Sometimes I was, sometimes I wasn't. But Maine is a large state with more coastline than California. I liked to point out plenty of old gray villages like the one I grew up in, plenty of places to get lost or hide, especially when socked in by a heavy fog. Maine, they'd heard of Damrascotta if they'd ever taken a vacation to the mid-coast, mid but they tended to pronounce the name wrong and then ask what it meant. And I would say either river or little fishes in Abenaki or something Scottish. We weren't really sure. If they asked what the town was known for, I would have said brick making, then ice shipping, then oysters, and this one little gallery that sells lobster buoys painted to look like political figures. But this was all before Maeve and I moved back home and bought our coastal charmer with a view, a listing so pyritic that its author, our realtor, met us at the door mid-apology and with a referral to a rodent removal service. Before my return, I was still telling that old joke whenever I needed to explain where I was from, about the local who has to give directions to a visiting urbanite. Quote, you can't get there from here, says the Mainer which tells you a little bit about the roads and highways on the mid coast, a little more about the shotgun wariness that'll greet you on so many overgrown front porches, and a lot about the granite break walls between those who've been here for generations and those who've landed more recently within the past century or so. I am one of these newer arrivals, not a true Mainer, if your parents are from elsewhere, you can't count. You don't count, even if you move to town at age three. But at least I'm not a tourist. We all scowl at the tourist. They ascend as one big traffic jam every summer and presume to know the place just because they've rented a cottage with bunk beds and weathered a gentle nor'easter. The other day, I saw a couple of matching sunglasses lingering in front of the Sotheby's, gazing at a flyer full of homes, one of which belonged to the Thatches, our town's wealthiest family. When I overheard them indulging in the fantasy of moving here year round, imagining Maine as the way life should be, I found myself wishing I had some other flyer with pictures of the peeling shack Ed Thatch lived in as a child, or the trailer he and his wife Steph moved into when they were only 18, or our own drafty ranch for that matter, just to show these dreamers that they might find if they ever arrived in the off season and ventured down the wrong dirt road. To move on from any of these dirt roads was supposed to be impossible, but then the Thatches did just that, moved from there to here. Well, past here, actually. Steph loved to remind us of their early days, all the hard work and long hours they had put into this different track. And it's not that we didn't believe her, just that we had heard it all before, heard it plenty. But every small town has its own running dramas, its own local celebrities. There's a set of twins that's been calling our high school basketball game since the big playoff run in 89. 
And there's a muscle farmer who wears a bodybuilding getup in every parade. And who's been doing it since I was in college? So I guess I always assumed I'd report, return to the Midcoast, if I returned, to find things basically where I'd left them. And most things were. Just not the thatches, which was fine. They were off in the distance, nothing to do with us. They rise and fall like a rolling swell tumbling down the coast. People do move here for the views. Ours is of the Salt Bay, partially, but also of our neighbor's three-car garage and a pyramid of algae-covered lobster traps. The real deal is how our realtor described the neighborhood meaning that what we'd see through our windows was mostly the slowly revving engine of Mainers going nowhere. Unless there's a fog, then there's nothing to see, only what everyone else can see, only what's right in front of us. But it was a sunny day in May the last time I saw Ed, one year ago now, when I, Meve, and our children, Jack and Jane, went to the Thatcher's house to attend, quote, a reception in honor of Amherst women's lacrosse. That Ed and Steph had somehow given life to and sent into the world a freshman midfielder on the Amherst women's lacrosse team had never stopped seeming completely implausible. And yet we all knew Allie's story. This was the daughter because Ed would give you the lowdown any chance he got. You'd be walking out of the post office or into the natural foods co-op when there'd be a loud honk and you'd look up to see Ed hanging out of the driver's side of his Silverado, banging a flat hand against the door. Hey, Andy, two goals against Tufts. She's some kind of role. <laughs> and before you even had time to congratulate her or really him, He'd be thundering down the low brick canyon of Main Street past the art gallery and the butcher shop, both of which leased from him. Our family was late getting to the reception, so had to park on the shoulder of the gravel driveway, way up by the main road, behind a chartered bus and a steep line of out-of-state SUVs, their rear windows papered in Amherst lacrosse stickers. Nantucket beach permits, and faux European circle decals designed to make MV and OBX seem like legitimate nation states. Back when Ed and I had worked as teenage dog hands at the pound, Ed would have called this visiting herd, your kind of people, Andy but he's the only one who ever called me Andy, and I always resented the characterization, perhaps because it fit. I'd gone away to Exeter, then Dartmouth, played lacrosse at both stops, roomed with Virginia aristocrats who now arrived at reunions with full-time nannies, and made a show of matching any and all donations to the scholarship fund. I thought I understood then what we were getting ourselves into. The women's lacrosse team would get fetid and fed the day before its big game against Bowdoin College. There would be chicken parm and Gatorade. Dads would get sloshed and lean a little too close and deliver pointed musings about the way the team ought to be run, who should be getting more of a burn, who shouldn't be riding more pine, They'd be wearing shiny polos with their country club's emblems on the breasts, pastel belts embroidered with whales and three woods. The moms would be overdressed in whatever summer attire had just arrived in the boutiques of Wellesley in Annapolis. And they would ask the players about their girlfriends or in this case, boyfriends, or well, maybe it didn't matter anymore. But as we steered our kids between the Thatcher's garage, formerly a farmhouse, and the house, 
formerly a barn, and made our way into the backyard, really a long shimmering meadow that humped down to the river over a series of small hills like an off-season ski slope. It became clear that Ed had taken the concept of pre-game receptions in a whole new direction. What we were stumbling into was more like a spectacular mid-coast themed carnival. There was a train of folding tables dressed in purple gingham tablecloths, a trailer length grill blowing smoke into the sky and a massive white tent strung with yards and yards of hanging light bulbs. There was even an inflatable lobster the size of an elephant. Where had Ed procured it? I had no idea. I assumed he must have stolen it from some boarded up state fair. Someone had wedged a lacrosse stick in the lobster's left claw and visitors were taking pictures of each other standing next to it as if they had slain the poor thing. The rest of the meadow was overtaken by players, parents and coaches, all of them wearing purple. Can we play in the bouncy castle? Jane asked our daughter, seven years old at the time. What bouncy castle? She pointed in the direction of an overinflated lobster trap, another carnival prop I never could have conceived of, bursting with children, all flopping around and jamming each other's heads between the pontoons. Yes, Maeve said, but bring your brother and, and don't touch anyone if they look sick. Like if they have a runny nose, stay away. Stranger danger, Jack said age six. That's something else, Jack, Jane said. You're something else, Jane. Go, Maeve said, have fun. The kids ran at the trap and Maeve and I headed for the tent. We passed a table at the edge of the lawn where I picked up a brochure proclaiming Damrascotta to be Maine's vacation haven. Steph Thatch's new marketing slogan, part of a rebranding effort, more on this later. And then we waded through the small clusters of guests saying hello to anyone we knew, our accountant, our kid's pediatrician, our sheepish realtor, all of whom looked a little confused by the surrounding festivities, but willing to go with the flow in exchange for an open bar until a man wearing a Hawaiian shirt over a turtleneck the school superintendent, I soon learn, corralled our marital unit and asked my permission to talk shop. About what? I said. No, no, he said, with Maeve. Maeve runs a non-for-profit called Eduverse that empowers students to write poems about their own lives. Here's a stanza I found on the kitchen table recently. So many seagulls around the parking lot it's like a party for seagulls. If you have a bike, you can bike right through them, but they'll just fly away. They'll be back to eat your trash someday. And once the superintendent had thanked May for all the fine work she'd done in the county's middle schools, he asked her how she might feel about expanding the program. May would be very interesting in expanding the program, she said, squeezing my hand in silent apology. This felt like my cue to slip away for a beer. So I waited until the superintendent wasn't looking and mouthed good luck to Maeve, who mouthed, get me something. So I mouthed, okay, what? And she mouthed, white wine. Actually, no, I could go for a beer. And by now the superintendent was looking again. So I said out loud, I'm on it and went hunting for the bar. I found it in one corner of the tent next to the Rays platform where Maine's most famous all white reggae band was just starting to, play, to plug in its amps. The bartender handed me two shipyards, both wrapped in purple cocktail napkins with the Amherst crest on one side, crossed lacrosse sticks on the other. And I thanked him and apologized because I didn't have any cash for a tip before following a trail of tiki torches down toward the river, 
where the fog was just beginning to snake along the shoreline, drafting, drifting north from the ocean. All of this land I had gazed upon many times, but always from the river, always from someone else's boat. The house was high on a hill. Pines lined the northern flank of the meadows, birches lined the southern flank. The grass was freshly mown. There was a new dock. I was hoping to take a look at Ed's old lobster boat, recently converted into a pleasure cruiser with roaring twin engines, Reuben to hit speeds northward of 50 knots. This overall, in total, rumored to cost northward of 250. But I never made it that far. Instead, I ran into Steph Thatch, Ed's wife, our mayor. Town manager was her official title, but she called herself the mayor, and we all followed suit, feeling like the difference was trivial, and she'd pretty much earned the right anyway. She was marching up from the dock, rising through the grass in black rain boots and tight blue jeans. She wore a gray flannel shirt and a down vest, the better part of a dead coyote serving as a hood. The garments were trimly cut, unzipped or unbuttoned to her freckled breastbone, her brown hair bedazzled with blonde highlights. She said hello and asked if I had seen her husband, which I hadn't. Well, either we launch this thing or we don't, Steph said. Which thing? She pointed to the steaming barrel-shaped smoker where the Dodwells, a brother-sister catering duo, also operators of the town's only taxi, were prodding at a mound of wet seaweed. You see any lobster? Steph asked me. I can't tell from here. That's because they're still in the river, she said. Ed insisted on supplying them himself. As he would, I said. Steph looked dubious. Since he's a lobsterman, I added. Of course he's a lobsterman, was a lobsterman. He wears a lot of hats, you know. He's been busy. This reception means the world to him. It's nice you're here. Great turnout, actually. I just worry he takes too much crap. Takes it? Or takes it on? Uh, takes it on. I had no idea if this was true. Ed struck me as the kind of rural titan who's come far enough in life to turn himself into a man of leisure, but perhaps that was only in my own dealings with him, which mostly concerned Allie's lacrosse career. He and Chuck already filled the three traps and put them in the river, Steph said. We were standing in the steepest part of the meadow, so she had to brace a hand on her uphill knee to hoist herself to my level. We're supposed to go out in the boat, and the girls are supposed to help them haul the lobster. I should have stopped him. <laughs> it's just too much. I looked at a few of the young women talking and laughing with their parents. I bet they'll enjoy going out on the water, I said. Oh, they'll love it, Steph said, but only if we go now. Otherwise, we've got issues. She looked behind her at the sky, which was continuing its sweep towards gray. Then she waved at a woman in a periwinkle cashmere sweater who waved back. Who the hell are you? Steph muttered through a smile, just loud enough for me to hear, before taking off in the women's direction, calling as she went, we didn't know if you'd make it. I sipped my beer. The challenge would to be to drink just one. I wasn't so, more worried, so much worried about getting drunk, although I probably would, more than putting on weight, which I already had. Right around then, as I turned my gaze upon the other men in the field, I realized there was a service I could provide, a way to contribute to the gathering. I would search the premises for Ed, let him know that his presence had been requested. At first, I couldn't find him anywhere. He wasn't on the meadow, wasn't in the tent, wasn't amongst all the boosters. Perhaps he was in the house. 
the bulking former barn with deck appended to the riverside, shingles do enough to hold only the slightest shade of ash, trim painted forest green. Steph had hired contractors from up the coast, blasted out all the old stable walls, pumped the roof full of skylights. I liked the look quite a bit. The inside, too. This I saw as I cupped my hands in the glass doors of the deck. I was impressed by the openness and vastness of it all. From background to foreground, an industrial strength kitchen, a high and wide stone fireplace, a living room carefully decorated in rustic antiques, black metal, raw wood, antler chandelier, vintage telescope, Vintage map of the mid coast. On the coffee table was a live, no, 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 a, a stuffed fox in an action pose facing me and snarling. The voices of the party were beyond earshot now, so behind me I heard only a gull, the wind, and what sounded like a murmuring brook. I couldn't detect any movement inside, but then I noticed a presence, an almost completely still presence, something or someone who didn't quite fit. Ed. Wherever he went, the ocean went with him, and I could sense it even through the glass, the salt in his beard, the mud beneath his nails. He was sitting in a chair in the middle of the room in his socks rubber boots upright next to his feet, leaning back, his hands on the squared off leather arms. His head was cast downward, possibly at the table next to the chair, but with his hat blocking my view. I couldn't tell for sure. I, I was about to knock on the glass when he shifted his gaze toward mine. For a moment, we eyed each other through the door and I felt caught. Hey, Ed, I said, sliding the door open. How are you doing, Andy? Doing well. Thanks for having us. I was expecting him to say something more, but he didn't. So I stood silently and he sat silently as the band launched into a cover of something familiar. They were down the hill and out of sight. Enter Sandman, set to a reggae beat. That was it. Quite the party, I said. Allie's team looks great. No wonder they're kicking ass this year. Yeah, he said. He spoke with a heavy Maine accent, a guttural dialect that inflected even the shortest of phrases. A moment passed. Steph's looking for you, I said. This got Ed moving, but only slowly. He reached across the armrest and flipped what looked like a manila folder from open to shut. He pulled on one boot, then the other, and pressed against the arms of the chair to lift himself to a standing position, stiffly at first, then loosening up, like a bear hitching itself onto its hind legs. I'm not short, but Ed had me by a couple of inches. He was always looking down from beneath the visor of a cap, an oily thumbprint on the bottom of each brim. Since I'd known him, he'd regularly worn what you might expect from someone who grew up on the southern tip of the peninsula with a UFO-sized satellite dish in the front yard and a deconstructed snowmobile in the back, diesel-stained jeans, hooded sweatshirt, dirty baseball cap, but on this day, the hat and hoodie matched, both purple, both with Amherst lacrosse printed in bold white letters across the chest or crest. The sweatshirt had been knifed at the collar to make room for a thick black beard. I had thought he'd be jovial today, excited about the reception. It was as close as the Thatchers would ever come to a debutante ball. His daughter, their family, officially accepted by the suburban elites who'd been paying private school tuitions and club team fees since their daughters were all in kindergarten together. But that wasn't the vibe. 
He came to the door and removed the second beer, the one intended for Maeve, from my grip. He raised one eyebrow as a way of showing gratitude, then slugged the whole thing. When he was done, he burped and said, you sure Steph was looking for me? Not EJ? EJ was Ed and Steph's son, Allie's older brother. I thought back, mm, Steph had definitely been looking for Ed. No, she said Ed, I said. That's good. For another long moment, Ed didn't say anything, and I thought we might have reached the end of the conversation. But then he said, now, Andy, he turned toward me, what the hell kind of name is Trip? I was at a loss and told him so. He repeated himself, but Trip meant nothing to me. Trip? I asked, with one P? Don't know. You're the English teacher. That was true enough, but it was in my capacity as lacrosse coach that I had come back into contact with Ed when I returned to town, and I couldn't remember any other instance when he acknowledged the other half of my job title. Hang on, he said, frowning, thinking back. Yeah, it, it, it was one P. Okay, so most likely that's a diminutive form of triple. Triple? Yeah, like the third, I said. For example, your son is Edward, Jr., and therefore, no, 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 he ain't. He's Everett Joseph. People just think he's a junior. Oh, I said. Well, if he were a junior, you could call him Chip, like Chip off the old block. <laughs> and if you were, he were a third, you could call him Trip. And if you were a fourth, I hesitated. Actually, I don't even know what you would call him then. Ed scratched at his beard for no longer looked interested in discussing thirds, fourths, fifths, none of the above. For whatever reason, my etymology lesson had set him at ease. So who is he? I asked. Who's who? Trip, <laughs> the person you just asked me about. Ed smiled and put his hand on my uh, muscle, trapezoidal muscle, squeezing hard enough to make me wince. Must be about them lobsters, he said. It took me a second to gather he was referring to the original premise of our conversation, why his wife might have been looking for him. But before I could respond, he removed his hand from my neck and walked right by me, past the inlaid hot tub. This had been the source of the brook-like noises, I now realized, but also the source of the previously undocumented chlorine odor and down the stairs to the meadows, disappearing into the crowd and the fog. The weather had overtaken the grass by then, muting the forms of the parents and the young women who, in their purple sweaters and pullovers, had spread across the field and under the tent as naturally as a dash of wild lupins. It was the type of ghostly dusk that comes to the mid-coast every spring, a whirl of smoke and light, the river air at once warm and chilling, whether they can fill this that can fill the sky with a sense of change what kind of change i can never tell somewhere in the back of my mind the paternal clock ticked i should check in on the kids and find Maeve another beer but instead i found myself glancing inside the house then out of the fog then back into the house i'm not sure what gave me the courage to go inside perhaps i felt invisible shrouded by the weather. But the next thing I knew, I was sliding the door closed behind me, and then I was alone in the Thatcher's home, standing next to a waist-high vase of pussy willows. I began to work my way around the great room, passing the windows overlooking the meadow, the fireplace, then a table topped with framed family photos, EJ as a 13-year-old with an overgrown crew cut and blank stare, oblivious to the laser show going on behind him. Allie in a purple headband with a lacrosse stick resting on her shoulder. The whole family of Ed's boat, rails gleaming in the sun, everyone dressed in suits and summer dresses. I peeked into the kitchen, as spotless and dimly lit as an after-hour showroom, and eventually made my way toward the center of the space, beneath the high oak beams, 
around the taxidermied fox on the coffee table, angling between the couches arranged in a U before the fireplace. Above the fireplace was a flat screen TV, and above the flat screen was a massive moose head with towering antlers and glassy black eyes. Next to Ed's chair was a table with a copper top. On the table was a manila folder, which I had seen Ed flip shut. Thick black letters on the folder read, Lincoln County Sheriff's Office Official Documents. And underneath was the department's circular seal. E.J. Thatch, Ed and Steph's son, was an officer with the Damariscotta Police Department. Not with the county, although the distinction wouldn't have occurred to me at the time. I just assumed the folder came from EJ. Family business. Definitely not my business. But I couldn't help myself. Whatever was inside the folder had been occupying Ed's mind, and I wanted to know what it was. I don't know how many of my neighbors would have done what I did, but I'm sure they all would have felt the urge. It wasn't just the open bar that had brought us to the reception, after all. We weren't friends with the Thatches. The Thatches didn't have friends. Using only one figure, finger, slowly lifting the edge of the folder, as if the fewer digits I employed, the less guilty I might be, I splayed the file open on the table. Inside were several photos, eight by 10. I turned over the first and saw what used to be a sedan. It was parked in a lot, a, an abandoned mill in the background. Half the building's windows missing, graffiti at the base of every smokestack. The pavement beneath the sedan was blacker than all the other pavement. The car's frame was charred and collapsed upon itself, shrunken like a dead insect. It was a police photograph so evinced a perceptible, almost blatant disregard for composition. The car was nearly centered in the photograph, but not quite. The horizon line was off by a few degrees. The light was too bright. I flipped to the next picture and the next. The first showed the trunk of the car, the second showed the back seat. In each case, I had the impression that what I was looking at was nothing more than the burned out husk of a vehicle. Everything was black and shapeless. But then I noticed a little pink in each photograph. Flesh. The skin of a burned victim peeling off a skull or a clavicle. Flesh. Now I could see. The car contained two bodies, both incinerated. I couldn't tell whether either soul had been dead before the flames had hit the skin, but it wouldn't have changed how I felt about the pictures. The sight was horrific, and I could sense almost viscerally the moment when the fire had sucked whatever last breath remained from the lungs. I couldn't look a moment longer. I regretted ever setting foot in the house. So I shut the folder and took a step back. I did it quickly, barely thinking, as though the photographs themselves were generating unbearable heat. An hour later, I was in the meadow, helping my children learn to throw and catch a lacrosse ball, half my mind still stunned by the images. When I heard sirens up the hill, I looked to the driveway, we all did, just as a line of state police cruisers burst from the woods, lighting the fog blue, then red, then blue. That's the prologue to the book, which certainly sense, uh, sets a, um, a curious motif. <laughs> Uh, for all the beautiful good things of our little niche here. And suddenly the word crime comes into, uh, into the scene in big black burning letters. Let me begin act, uh, act one, <laughs> scene one uh, of uh, the book. I may not be able to get to the end. And I do want to end with a very interesting paragraph that I thought quite insightful. 
uh, about returning to Maine. So I'm going to make time for that paragraph at the end. But this is chapter one, following the prologue. Excuse me. Going back in time. With my parents' arrival on the Midcoast in the winter of 1978, my dad became the only orthopedic surgeon in the county, which made us one of the richest families around, although to be rich in Damariscotta is to be middle class almost anywhere else. None of the locals have or had much money. We lived in a two-bedroom cottage, and my parents shared one yellow Volvo in those early days. Once I was old enough to go to school, my mom started going to studying art in Portland, accounting in New Hampshire, then forestry in Vermont. After she uh, earned her degree, she found a job organizing weekend retreats hosted by a Penobscot Native American named Jerry Crowfoot, the type of boondoogle where you made lodgings out of pine bow boughs stripped deer hide from the carcass, ate like natives ate, etc., etc. They made you camp next to a paper mill and you had to pretend you couldn't see the smokestacks or smell the sulfur. I was always bored. I mean, all my childhood. I begged for siblings, pleaded to move back to the suburbs of Boston, but especially on those Indian weekends. During one of the retreats, one that my dad was also forced to attend, he and I made a lacrosse stick out of branches, buck intestines, and straw. He had played lacrosse, like I would someday, at Dartmouth. Neither of us expected the stick to become anything more than ornamental, but somehow it could throw and catch without completely turning to tinder, and I still have the stick. It hangs on the wall of my classroom between the whiteboard and the window. As we played catch, I must have been seven or eight, my dad said, I'm sorry your mom and I have been fighting so much. This was not something I had noticed, so I didn't respond. I just threw the ball back in his direction. He caught it. Anyway, you don't have to worry, he said. We'll figure it out. Okay, I said. The assumptions were always that I'd stay in Damariscotta and attend Lincoln High School, but Lincoln didn't have a hockey team, and I was outgrowing my club team in Augusta. So during my freshman year, I started applying to boarding schools and eventually gained acceptance to Phillips Exeter Academy. As a way of celebrating, my mom and dad told me they were getting divorced. Although the co-eval co nature of our family's upheaval and my departure was, I'm pretty sure, a coincidence. I repeated my freshman year at Exeter, which put me on a different trajectory from my friends back home. And after that, I always felt a little out of sync with everything. I left behind everyone who stayed on the mid coast, like a, a severed trap marker that comes and goes in the tides, never finding the old block that once tied it to the river bottom. Not that I ever really miss the feeling of being chained to a place. After the divorce, my mom took the position of general manager of a general store overlooking the South Bristol gut the narrow waterway that links our river to the one to the east. South Bristol is populated in the winter almost entirely by lobster men and their families, but in the summer, it's close enough to Christmas Cove to be to semi-support the kind of store my mom ran, a place that sold imported cheese, charcuterie, the New York Times, wine that wasn't necessarily named after its varietal, I helped her there on summer afternoons, digging out ice cream, filling out crossword puzzles, and reading books like A Farewell to Arms and Catch-22, novels my favorite English teachers had recommended at the end of spring classes. Did I complain about the indignity of working for my mother? Yes. Yes, I did. But even then, I had to admit, only to myself, obviously, that life could be worse because at least I was allowed to sleep in. 
But then I caught a bad break. Tracy Thatch, Ed's mom, had her knee replaced by my dad. Apparently he, dad, had been observing my pathetic work ethic. And so by the time he stopped by Tracy's hospital room in mid-June for a routine post-op consultation, had already determined that his son's employment would be bargained off as a thank you to the Hatches for allowing him to build them for his services. The Thatch Lobster Pound was where my dad always stopped to fuel up his fishing boat and it sat on a petrified forest of sea-stained pilings on the other side of the harbor from my mother's general store, staring across like an old cranky seagull drying its wings. My dad knew precisely how convenient the new arrangement would be, and I understood, even then, that a real job, a hard job, was supposed to forge something substantial in me. On that first day, I reported as a bleary-eyed 15-year-old to a disjointed collection of gray buildings that toppled down the harbor bank and leveled out at the dock. Dawn hadn't even happened yet. The pier was wide enough to hold trucks that would back across the planks, load up, then drive straight to Boston or New York or anywhere else on the planet that featured Maine lobster on the menu. The Thatches owned the pond and had for generations, but it was Ed, the elder of Wade and Tracy's two sons, a tall boy who wore tie-dyed t-shirts and baseball hats you could only give if you sent away the required number of proofs of purchase from cigarette cartons, who pretty much ran the place. He was lanky, but then already strong. He could toss 90 pound crates around the dock the way I could throw baskets of dirty laundry downstairs to the basement. On the morning I met him, there was no sun. The only light at the pound came from a yellow covered lamp bolted atop the end of the pier. I found Ed in the process of coiling the diesel hose. Andy, right, he said. He finished making a perfectly circular stack of hose. Then he kicked it to make it bounce back and pounce open and untangle like an angry snake. Now you do it, he said. Uh, do what? Coil her up. How? Didn't you just watch me? I took the nozzle and started winding it in a circle, but it was rigid to my touch and wouldn't go where I wanted it to. No, he said. I tried to wind it in the other direction. Still, nope. What am I doing wrong? The whole damn thing. He took the, the hose, coiled it again, taking pains to demonstrate how one ought to make a twisting motion with every loop. And then he told me it was time to blast out the bait shed. Once inside the walk-in freezer, I stood ankle deep in a pool of blood and salt shivering in my borrowed rubber boots as Ed tipped over the half-full barrels of redfish. It was the foulest room I had ever set foot in. All that waste redolent of a grisly mass homicide, but when I glanced across at Ed, he was grinning back at me while hosing a spray of clean water into a pool of roiling bloody water. Hope you ate breakfast, he said. Then he shoved over a full barrel of bait and watched the guts splash onto my jeans and all the way up to my fleece. Well, sorry about that, Andy. Eventually, Ed taught me how to bend at the knees while lifting lobster crates off the boats and how to patch these crates when their wooden slats busted loose. But he always acted aggrieved by my perpetual ignorance as if these skills were ones I should have intuited as an infant. So I despise the lessons and I despise the job every moment of it. That Ed could work for hours on end for such paltry wages at the age of what, 14, 15? Taking breaks only to patrol the river on his little skiff and haul his own traps without ever once bitching about the crappiness of it all, 
I took as evidence that there was something seriously wrong with him. Naturally, I began devising ways to minimize my hours at the pound. After my sophomore year, I started staying at school to work as a gopher at the hall hockey camp, spending more and more time away from home, the academic year plus the middle of the summer. And after my junior year, I decided I couldn't handle another round of grunt work. So in June of 92, I went to the pound and told Wade Hatch that I regretted the decision already, but it was time for me to retire. Ed handles the dock hands, he said. Oh, well, okay, but uh, you got to talk to Ed. So I was looking for Ed. He was 17 then. He had reached his full height, his shoulders straight across, his arms lean as rebar. I don't think I can work this summer, I told him. It was early morning, and I found Ed by the water smoking a cigarette, fixing a hatch in the dock that served as a portal to the briny underworld. Going back to New Hampshire, he asked, cigarette nodding as he spoke. I am, yeah, but does it make se just doesn't make sense starting here when I have to leave after three weeks. Probably easier for you if you just find someone who can work the whole summer. Ed slammed a final nail into the dock and stood straight with hammer still in hand. He tugged at the brim of his cap and looked out at the harbor. The sun was warming the backs of the birches on the far side of the South Bristol gut. And as soon as it rose above the tree line, the morning would get hot. You could feel it. Imagine, Ed said. Imagine was a local derivation of, I imagine that so. But Ed always said it flatly, possibly sarcastically, which made it hard to respond, especially when I had already said all I needed to say. So we stood in silence until the alarm on the swing bridge began to clang and echo across the waterways. I looked over the lobster buoys and between the fishing boats to the bridge. The road was slowly splitting apart and swiveling open, making way for a sport boat that gurgled into the harbor on its own rippling wake. The boat arched toward the dock, growing larger and larger, louder and louder, her stern sliding into view. She was called the Real Butte Two, and had a Falmouth port of call. She wasn't a big rig, but there were twin outboards on her back, which filled the whole channel with a steady rumble until the hull bumped into the dock and the helmsman cut the engines. He was in his mid forties, wearing old leather topsiders, blue jeans, a Harley Davidson t-shirt. He had a long black ponytail. On the stern, ready to toss us a line, was a girl about our age with a deep tan that seemed otherworldly the kind of skin you never see in Maine. She was bearing a, wearing a Baja jacket with stripes the colors of a Jamaican flag and cut off jean shorts that were shorter than their own pockets. Her hair was gathered in a loose ponytail and everything about her looked thrown together as though she'd just slid out of bed. I'll stop there. You certainly can get the gist of things. The girl we're talking about here does become Ed's wife. So this is Steph, as we discovered in the, the prologue. Uh, and so it's uh, pointing out here in the beginning chapter um, of the, uh, the blue collar work world of Ed and not so much of Steph in the beginning until she decides to marry him and have a baby at age 18. Uh, but that gives you the feeling. But in the final moments, I wanted to read something that sounds like it's coming directly from the heart and soul of the writer, Mr. White. I mean, all the words come from the heart, soul, and mind and creativity of the writer, don't they? But um, this, I think it just had, when I read it, uh, well into the book, page 302 out of, what did I say earlier, 324. So very late in the book, it just sounds like the words of the writer more so than the words of a character. When we narrate the past, it helps to place ourselves as close as possible to the center 
of the action. But the problem is, the vast majority of humans, or maybe just well-to-do Americans, never get all that close to the center of anything. Instead, we get this other life. When I try to be grateful for, I, me, Jane, and Jack feel at home in Dermascotta, even if I always believe that to stay on the mid-coast or even to return to it would mean that I'd given up on the pursuit of something greater, which may well be the case. But at a certain point, the hardest thing about so much of your ambition going unfulfilled becomes finding out that you're basically okay with the way things have gone. And while it could be said that I haven't been at the center of any story that anyone would find very interesting, it would also be said that I've been near enough to a few of them. And I think, or hope, that all that matters, returning to that impulse I've been trying to identify, the desire to be somehow nearer a tragedy is what I feel when I've achieved some distance from the episode. And the way I feel then is relieved. I'm happy I have what I have. I'm happy I haven't lost any of it along the way. I could have risked more and perhaps lived to tell about it and therefore had more to tell. But with all apologies to my younger self, I can't think of a single instance from my past that I wish had gone another way. The words of the character, the words of the author. <laughs> I think it's uh, very insightful. That word was used in one of the reviews, you might recall. Insightful and wise is another word that was used. I think that was also a good choice. Well, I shall leave you there. The story is slow and moving, which I felt while I was reading it, a little frustrated at times, but then I realized that stories move slowly here. We're in no rush on the mid coast in general. Um, and so let's go slowly and evaluate and look at every angle of things. And then as one reaches the halfway point, of course, things start barreling and crime becomes the hot button, let me say. It's a great book for a young man who's uh, just written his first one. It's a very polished uh, book and publication, obviously uh, printed, uh, published by Hogarth, which is a very reputable company, needless to say, part of Random House. So I think our Adam White, our local boy made good, so to speak, <laughs> has made a, a tremendous accomplishment with his very first book. Anyone in Dambascotta, or I should say everyone in Dambascotta should read the book, uh, and anyone in the Midcoast area, he captures the Midcoast so well, um, and uh, especially for a young man. Anyway, The Mid-Coast, a novel by Adam White. I do hope you'll read it. And congratulations, Mr. White. If I may, I'd like to take just a couple of moments to um, tell you a bit about next week's book. Uh, coincidentally, we're going to stay in the same year, 2022, uh, with another recently published book, coincidentally. We go from a young man who's written his first book, Mr. White today, to an old man at age 80, who has had a brilliant career as a book writer. And this, he claims, is his last big book. You may be ahead of me already. It came out only two or three weeks ago. <laughs> the name of the book is The Last Chairlift, and the writer is none other than Mr. John Irving. So an interview on NPR was a wonderful experience. I ran out and put my name on the list 
as soon as they came to the bookstore. <laughs> so I'm hoping to get through it by a week from today. <laughs> Let me tell you just a couple of things about the book, just to sort of entice you. John Irving, one of the world's greatest novelists, returns with his latest novel in seven years. A ghost story, a love story, and a lifetime of sexual politics. Not unlike some of his other books. <laughs> We're in Aspen, Colorado in 1941. Rachel Brewster is a slalom skier at the National Downhill and Slalom Championships. Little Ray, as she is called, finishes nowhere near the podium, but she manages to get pregnant. Back home in New England, Little Ray becomes a ski instructor. Her son, Adam, grows up in a family that defies conventions and evades questions concerning the eventful past. Years later, looking for answers, Adam will go to Aspen in the Hotel Jerome, where he was conceived, Adam will meet some ghosts. In the last chairlift, they aren't the first or the last ghosts he sees. John Irving has written some of the most acclaimed books of our time, among them, The World According to God, one of my favorite book, um, movies, and Cider House Rules, another great movie as well as a book. A visionary voice on the subject of sexual tolerance, Irving is a bard of alternative families. In the last chairlift, readers will once more be in his thrall. So some of similar themes, I must say, as today's book, but I thought it uh, interesting to put it side by side. A new book by a young man and a final book of this size, he will write short stories, he says, uh, by an 80 year old legend in the book writing world. So I hope you'll be with me next week for John Irving's new book, The Last Chairlift. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed Mr. White's attempts with his first novel and also some of the background quotes talking about coming home, coming home anytime, but coming home for the holidays as we speak. Uh, if you did enjoy the uh, video, please uh, do us a favor and press that little thumbs up icon below the screen. Or uh, you may want to share it uh, with a friend. And please do leave a comment, uh, especially if you're from Damascata. <laughs> I'd love to hear some comments. Uh, you can also, of course, at any time, leave uh, the name of a book and its author. A uh, favorite of yours that you would like us to read on this program. The Mid Coast is number 108 in our recordings in the last couple of years. So give us something to make 110, Mr. Irving's 109. Also, I encourage you to subscribe there on your screen to the Camden Public Library's programs YouTube channel uh, to stay on top of all, all the great content going on at the library. Um, we are still, I had happily to say, number one in the state of Maine, as far as the public libraries with the most subscribers to a program's YouTube channel, even ahead of some of our big brothers and big sisters in bigger cities. <laughs> so do subscribe. It doesn't cost anything at all. It's just a support of our programs, which we'd really appreciate. Thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful week ahead as we count down to the end of the year through the holidays uh, period coming up, both Hanukkah and Christmas. And uh, I hope that you are planning some nice and contemplative moments as well as partying moments. Enjoy the weather and I hope we'll see you next week. Thanks again. Goodbye. <laughs>